brothers and sisters, having crossed the overflowing Jordan River by God's power, Israel passed their first gateway, Jericho, with great ease. Obeying God's command, Israel marched around the city for seven days. On the seventh day, after they marched around it seven times and gave a loud shout, the sturdy wall crumbled down. At this point, God had the seven priests blow the seven trumpets of ram's horns. You know, we have many sevens here. Seven days, seven times, seven priests. Just as I, as I mentioned, the seven priests blew seven trumpets of ram's horn. You know, seven signifies perfection. The leprous general Naaman was also healed of the disease after washing seven times. So, it signifies that God's works take place when we completely trust and obey the word of God. Showing perfect, uh, showing perfect obedience, Israel destroyed the city of Jericho and went up towards the city of Ai, their next target. Because the city is smaller than Jericho, they assumed they would win more easily but suffered a miserable defeat. We talked about this in the last session. Just because Israel crossed the Jordan, just because they conquered Jericho, doesn't mean they completed the task of conquering Canaan. When people work towards a goal, they conduct themselves prudently with great resolve, but once they overcome some major challenges, they become lax or arrogant, messing up their work. But people who are successful don't put themselves at ease, but do their utmost until they achieve their goal. As for the Israelites, they shouldn't have become lax just because they'd achieved the great tasks of Jordan River and Jericho. They should have been on alert with self-control until the final victory. They should have received God's help as the better continued. Today, I'll speak to you on why Israel was defeated by Ai and how they got through this hardship. I hope that you apply this message well in your efforts in your efforts to achieve God's work or in receiving blessings on a personal level. As you learn about how Israel marched in faith, I want you to demonstrate even greater faith and receive blessings. As you learn about how Israel made a mistake, I want you to learn how you can stay on the prosperous path without mistakes. Also, as you hear about how Israel suffered trials for their sins, hopefully you wisely resolve to always dwell in God, thereby living in protection and love. I pray in the Lord's name that everything I'm sharing with you today will become a source of great wisdom and strength and you will always receive the blessing of Canaan flowing with milk and honey. To conquer the land flowing with milk and honey is, you know, we, our final goal is New Jerusalem. But in our life, we go through the journey of taking the land of Canaan. Also, we have to receive blessings. Sometimes we feel like we are now conquering the Canaan. We are now conquering. Each each one of us has goals. I hope you can conquer them and overflow with testimonies and have spiritual growth. Brothers and sisters, as the Israelites' army returned from a huge defeat in the city of Ai, which they thought was easy to conquer, Joshua bitterly lamented and prayed with the elders. Such repentance should be with us as well. We rejoice when we receive healing and blessings. But in our trouble, in our difficulties, When we are going through trials and tests, we have to do as Joshua did. We have to pray to God and receive resolution. You may think we have ups and downs. 
you shouldn't think that way. Whenever we face a trouble, we have to think why we are going through that trouble and try to find a solution from God, from the Bible. In order, in order to do so, we have to kneel down and fast and pray and receive a resolution from God. They also realized that this wasn't just a defeat, but God turned His face away from Israel. We should have such, we have to have our spiritual eyes opened. Like this, when we face a situation, when we shouldn't, while living out in the world, we live as, as the sons and daughters of God, and we have to live in privileges as God's children. You may think we sometimes live in blessings or difficulties. You shouldn't think that way. You, in difficulties, we have to find out the reason why. Why God couldn't protect you. Joshua, after he suffered a defeat in Ai, he didn't just think this was a single defeat. He realized that he he realized that God turned his face away from them. Until then, Israel acted boldly before strong enemies. Even the Canaanites were afraid of them. This was absolutely because God was with Israel. If God left Israel, they couldn't help but be destroyed. Being surrounded by the enemies, not knowing why God wasn't with Israel in the battle against Ai and what they should do from then on, Joshua rent his heart and pleaded with God with tears. We have heard about the victory Israel and Joshua achieved. Joshua was a man of God when he was with Moses. He served Moses with all his heart. He was a great help to Moses. And when Moses was not around, Joshua held on to the word of God and obeyed and tried to lead the Israelites into Canaan in order to lead them to blessings and answers. But as he suffered a defeat, he tried to find out why the reason was God turned His face away from them and because He didn't know exactly why, He earnestly prayed. We shouldn't become lax. You shouldn't think like, I'm, I'm living by God's word, I saw I know God's will very well. You shouldn't become lax or conceited like this. As you also, as we deal with church members, we shouldn't say, you are suffering this because of this and that. We have, shouldn't be, be arrogant like this. No matter what kind of situation we have, we have to plead with God with tears and try to find the exact solution, just like Joshua did. Joshua lowered his heart and pleaded with God with tears, so God answered him. In response, God notified Joshua of why they were defeated. He said, Israel had sinned, and they, ha- and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Jericho was the first city they conquered. So God commanded them to offer the city and everything in it. Just as I mentioned in the last session, but someone among them violated it. God told them to offer everything, but some of them took it personally, and that person, and they had to find him and resolve the issue. Before this issue was resolved, God couldn't be with Israel. Although it already seemed late, because they found out the reason they needed to track down the sinner and remove evil 
from among them. But God didn't directly say who the sinner was. Instead, He told them to find the sinner among all the congregation. Rather than instructing them to question each person or having trials, God had them draw lots so that He Himself would pick him out. First, as all the tribes of Israel drew lots, all the representatives came out and drew lots, and one of the tribes got the lot. The lot fell on one of the tribes, then it fell on one of the clans of that tribe, then one of the families of that clan, and lastly, a man from that family. Through that process, finally, Achan was chosen. Having no way to get away with this, Achan admitted all his sins. During the battle against Ai, he took a beautiful robe, silver, and gold from the spoils of the city which were to be offered to God. He hid them in the ground and inside his tent. We can feel this is the work of God who is delicate and has everything under control. Mathematically, the probability of being picked out by the lot was the same for every person. Let's say 100 people drew lots. Every one of them shares a 1% chance of being picked out. But among all the Israelites, which were millions in number, God picked out the exact person. The Bible says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Just watching the process of God's revealing a c o n s e n s we can once again confirm that God knows all things clearly and has everything under His control. Also, we have to remember that even though the sins were committed by a single person, God couldn't be with all the Israelites. We see such cases in the church. There are times God requires the faith of the whole congregation. Let's say a church has 1,000 members. The whole doesn't necessarily mean all the 1,000 members, but as for some great works, the majority has to show faith for them to happen. It doesn't mean for all matters, for all situations, just a single person's fault may bring trials to the entire church. You know, our spiritual life is our relationship with God. But for special occasions, there are times when the entire church has to show faith or when the entire church pleases God, God is pleased with our unity and brings about great works. But usually, in in your life, suppose you commit sins, it doesn't mean another person suffers because of you, but I'm talking about great works, talking about great works God achieves. At such times, if one of the church workers someone in the leadership commits a sin, the entire church may suffer trouble. Conversely, when a single person pleases God, for example, Moses pleased God, right? And just as he pleased God, the entire congregation was blessed. Also, when a pastor or a Levite commits wrongdoing because they are paid by the church, If they commit a sin, the entire church can suffer trouble. Also, a Levite and a pastor, also they have an individual, individual relationship with God. But if they d i s h e a r t e n God so much, the entire church may suffer trouble. The Bible says, one sinner destroys much good. The verse signifies that disobedience 
of a single person could lead his entire group to severe hardship or destruction. This was true of Israel. Due to Achan's sins, God turned His face away from them, and this resulted in their defeat in the battle against Ai. What God wanted from His people who were about to conquer Canaan was perfect sanctification and obedience on a congregational level. Just a single person's fault, did they all suffer destruction? You know, they crossed the Jordan and destroyed the Jericho. It's all what God did. So they had to obey God wholly, not just some of them, but all of them. Because they were people of God, they should have obeyed God completely. That's what God asked them to do. And in their conquering Canaan, they had to, they had to please God. So God wanted, wanted all of them to obey His word. And only then could they conquer Canaan, said God. That's why disobedience of a single person brought about the terrible outcome of God leaving the entire Israel. Achan's sin brought about their defeat in the city of Ai. What did Israel have to do? They had to wipe out the traces of sins from among them, them demolishing the wall between God and themselves. A similar case is found in the book of Jonah. Jonah disobeyed God's command of going to Nineveh and proclaiming its destruction. Instead, he boarded the ship bound for Tarshish, traveling in the opposite direction. The ship boarded by uh, Jonah, who disobeyed God's command, met with a big storm. At this time, the people on board the ship, because the first thing they did was they tried to solve the problem in their own way. They tried to make the ship lighter. They oared. Even though they tried, they were in a situation where they couldn't be protected. So they said to one another, they said, this surely came by God's curse. So we have to find out who caused this to happen. So they suggested drawing lots. Even though they were not believing God, they acknowledged God. So they suggest to one another saying that there's someone who who made angered God. So we have to find a person. And they drew lots. And exactly, the lot fell on Jonah. It was a situation where they were in a danger of being shipwrecked. They were concerned. While they were concerned, Jonah was falling asleep in the bottom of the ship. He didn't even feel what kind of situation he was in. And the people took him out from the bottom of the ship and the flood fell on Jonah. Actually, Jonah thought it would be okay to run away to Tarshish. But as he he realized that tribulation resulted from his faults, he, he suggested to the people on board he he suggested to the people on board saying like this storm came because of me so you can throw me into the sea this was out of a repenting heart he didn't say like we all of us should be saved but he acknowledged that he angered God that's why you are suffering so you have to throw me into the sea he thoroughly acknowledged his fault like this. You know, how did they respond? Even though the lot fell on Jonah, and even though he admitted his guilt, even though the people recognized this, he didn't throw him out instantly. They all, all, of, all of them wanted to live together, so they tried very hard to... Even so, they couldn't get away 
from the disaster that God sent down. So they couldn't help but throw Jonah into the sea. And they threw him into the sea. As soon as they did so, the storm calmed down and they got out of the crisis. We can confirm that a single person's fault caused that and you know thrown into the sea Jonah was to die but the great fish prepared by God swallowed him and Jonah fasted and bitterly repented you know a great fish swallowed him let's say you are swimming in the sea and you are swallowed you are attacked by a shark then you die But he was, he came into the belly of that great fish. And being inside that belly of the great fish, where it was so dark and very smelly, he began to repent bitterly because God knew the heart of Jonah. God didn't leave him alone. God didn't have him attacked by a shark, but Instead, he had him go into the belly of a great fish. Jonah said, While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. He was praying like this by faith. He was confessing his fault, and he confesses that God would listen to his prayer. He said, forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. While Jonah admitted that he met with the trouble for his faults, he offered God a confession of thanks for saving him. He was inside the belly of a great fish. He recognized that God was giving him the opportunity because He also offered a confession of thanksgiving. So, in our trouble, if you truly believe in God, we have to repent and turn back. Then you can receive His mercy like Jonah did. And Jonah said, Jonah determined to obey God's will. Seeing Jonah repenting and turning back, God had mercy on him and commanded the fish to vomit Jonah onto dry land. Even though Jonah had been in a distance, I mean, I mean, the fish exactly vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Even though Jonah had been in a distress, disastrous situation resulting from his great sin, as he bitterly repented and turned back, he was able to receive God's help. Likewise, the Israelites wiped out all the traces of disobedience. The people took Achan and his family members, animals, and possessions to a valley and stoned them. They burned them and heaped up a large pile of rocks. We have to think. You shouldn't think Achan was pitiful. I I mean, you shouldn't have pity on him. Then you cannot realize his will. We have to remember how the people on the ship suffered because of Jonah. At first, the people on the ship tried to solve the problem even though they knew Jonah was cause of the suffering. And Jonah even told them to throw him into the sea. They shouldn't have had mercy on Jonah. They should have... It doesn't mean to say Whenever a person commits a fault, whenever someone commits a sin, we have to destroy him. I mean, we shouldn't apply the message that way. We have to destroy the sinful natures themselves. By the sin of Achan, Israel suffered a defeat in the city of Ai, and they tried to find the cause, and they took all Achan's sufferings. When they saw them being judged, 
the Israelites must have thought we should have never committed sins. The sin brings about trials and makes God leave us. Just as Achan suffered destruction, we have to... They... Because God knew Achan committed sin, when Joshua prayed with tears, God told them, someone among you disobeyed me. God didn't say it was Achan. God could have said Achan, but He didn't do so. But God had them draw a lot. And how Israelites must have felt. They must have vividly felt how bad it is to commit sins. They must have been scribed in their heart how bad it is to commit sins. So that in our life, when a person commits sin, the Bible says, tells us to go to him and advise him and give them advice. Unless he turns back, you have to notify the church. Even so, he doesn't repent, you have to consider him a Gentile. The Bible doesn't tell tell us to kill him or in the New Testament time, uh, I mean, God had the Israelites deal with Achan that way as an example. As you see, Achan killed and even his family members killed. How should we apply this in our lives when we face troubles or difficulties? First, we have to look back on ourselves and demolish the wall of sin. In addition, we have to remove even the sinful natures That's how the Israelites dealt with the sin of Achan. That's how the Israelites removed the sins and evil. But usually, for the resolution of our problem, because we are, when, when we are in trouble, we try to repent for the resolution of our problem. Right now, we don't commit sins. When we are suffering from diseases or disaster, we wouldn't commit sins. In trouble, we would protect ourselves from committing sins. So God gives us grace. God gives us help. But as time passes, when we have a peaceful time, we begin to love the world again and go back to our old ways. But it's not the the way the Israelites dealt with Achan's sin. Once we realize our faults, we have to remove completely even those sinful natures, cut them out of ourselves. That's what Father God is telling us. We have to remove even the traces of the sin and evil. That's how the Israelites dealt with the issue of Achan. After Israel destroyed the sins and evil of Achan, they destroyed them because the sins and evil could have spread among them. It could have spread, it could have led to second or third sins. Achan disobeyed God and God didn't God considered it a great problem and God gave them awakening. So Israel didn't say like God, Israelites didn't have mercy on Achan. God had but the first generation even when they suffered a disaster you know Korah and his followers stood against Moses and the earth split and they all fell into the earth and how did they respond? the people came to Moses and argued with, against him and he protested against Moses because of you they were killed 
just compare how they did to the second generation. Also, we have to look at the sim- we have to remove the sinful natures and evil from our heart when we do so we are like the Israelites who dealt with a c o n sin and received blessings later on after Israelites dealt with a c o n sin God was back with Israel and God told in detail about the strategy to attack. God told Israel that they shall advance on the city and then pretend to give a fight and flee so that the soldiers of Ai would be lured away from the city. At this point, some of the soldiers ambushing between Behind the city shall take over the empty city and destroy the enemy forces in collaboration with the soldiers that pretend to flee. You know, one of their groups was was ambushing behind the city. And and the other group was... So when the soldiers of Ai came out, they... came inside the city of Ai, God told them this strategy. As God told them, shortly after they began to fight, they pretended to give up fight and flee. Then the soldiers of Ai, who had defeated Israel once, chased after the army of Israel. because they had defeated the soldiers of Ai must have arrogantly thought like they are our prey there would be no problem they claim God is with them but they are losing and running away so they just put themselves at ease and chased after Israel leaving the gates to the city wide open. Because God, because God already recognized their heart, He gave Israel that strategy. As Joshua gave a signal with javelin, the soldiers in ambush quickly rose from their positions and took over the empty city, thereby winning a great victory. As they obeyed God's strategy, it was only natural that they won. If only they obeyed, they were ever victorious. Watching how they conquered the city of Ai, we can draw some valuable lessons. The first one is, we should discern God's will first in all affairs. Before Israel first attacked, Before Israel's first attack on Ai, Joshua should have asked God about the battle rather than accepting man's way of thinking. Joshua should have asked God about the battle just as he had been doing. He he should have committed all things to God and asked Him. They shouldn't have become lax because of their victory in Jericho. They should have humbly sought God's strength until they completely conquered Canaan. In planning or completing accomplishing a task in our workplace or businesses, we should first hear the Holy Spirit and receive His guidance through fervent prayer and discern God's will and obey. Then, we can make the impossible possible and be led onto the prosperous path. That's why you shouldn't stop praying. People try to pray only in difficulties, but we shouldn't do so. I mean, if you always pray, when you are in trouble, as soon as you pray, you can receive resolution. But if you don't, If you cease to pray, it takes a longer time to receive answer even when you pray. 
When you pray always, you don't meet a trouble. Even if you meet a trouble, you can resolve it immediately. So you have to realize the importance of prayer and commit things to God and receive His guidance. Second, to walk with God, we should completely rid ourselves of sins and evil and be sanctified. Israel was defeated by I, not because its inhabitants were strong or great in number, but because God was not with them. After they wiped out Achan's sins and evil, God was back with them so they could quickly conquer the city of Ai. The same goes for us. Just as Israel burned up Achan and all that belonged to him, we should cast off all forms of evil without anything left. Only then can we become bold before God and receive whatever we ask of Him. As for some people, they are without God's answers but suffer miseries. But they neither repent nor reflect on themselves, but blame the blame their environment or another person. Other people try to hide their sins before God. Still, other people pretend to be holy while their heart is full of evil. But they can never hide anything before God. Those people cannot walk with God. The fact that God is not with you. is a great problem. Joshua and Israelites considered it a great problem. They didn't just think we... They didn't consider it a single defeat. They didn't think... But they thought why we failed to conquer even the small city they realized that God was not with them and they considered it a great issue and they tried to find out why God was not with them and resolve that issue. And that's why God was back with them. And we also have to examine whether God is with you or not. We have to always keep this in mind. The fact that God is not with us should be a great problem. Jesus said, He who sent me, namely God, is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. Jesus was the King of God and the Lord of Lords, and He came to the earth. He, even so, He didn't say, but he always confessed that God was with him and he admitted that because God was with him he was bearing such fruit always you have to make sure that God is with you and why didn't God leave Jesus alone? it was because Jesus always pleased him Jesus, Jesus was sinless And He only did what pleased Him always in the truth. That's why God was always with Him. Therefore, during Jesus' ministry, no one could dare interfere right in front of Him. When Jesus was not around, they plotted against or gossiped about Him, saying like, He's a deceiver, He's possessed by demon, by Beelzebub, He's a bad man. But they didn't dare do that before Jesus. except when He suffered the crucifixion. Because He was bearing our sins, and because God was turning His face away from Him, He went through all kinds of suffering, being beaten and spat on. Was this because Jesus had sins? It was because He was to save It was to fulfill God's providence of saving us, mankind. This was the only exception. Other than this time, God was always with Jesus because God was God was always with Jesus, protecting Him because Jesus had no sins and evil. He always walked with God. As it's evidence, God had Him manifest signs and wonders in great power wherever He went. Likewise, to the extent we cast off sins and evil and live, of, live by the Word, 
God makes us prosper in all affairs. Once we become sanctified and come into spirit, we can walk with God, although not to the full extent. As we, as we reach the level of whole spirit and of pleasing God, we can always walk with God. God immediately answers our prayer and leads us to be prosperous always. We have to long for such level of faith. We can do it. We can make it. And God, and God tells us to do so. Some of you may say, it's okay if I just don't commit sins. None of you would say so. You have to make sure God works with you. You have to make sure all your thoughts, all your words, please God, so that God is overwhelmed with joy and is glorified through us. And wherever you go, you can give evidences of being with Him in your workplace, in your businesses or families. I ask you to... Thus, we should cast off all sins and evil without any of them remaining and achieve perfect sanctification, thereby becoming God-pleasing true children. Have you lost the desire for such sanctification? You may say, I'm not committing sins. I don't, I'm not committing evil. Do you think that way? You have to live in the light and the truth and the goodness. You have to forgive others. You have to understand and yield to others. And you have to work hard with all your life. If you don't do so, it is also a sin. If you have ill feelings, if you, have, if you can't make peace with others, if you, if you are just satisfied, I'm not fighting with them. You keep a distance from them. In doing so, you say, I'm not committing sins. You have to make the truth completely come upon us, and we have to long for sanctification. We have to check our feelings. We have to see whether we judge someone. We have to examine whether we judged others, whether we... That's not faith. We have to live a life. When you meet a situation, do you find yourself filled with worries? That's not faith. It's fleshly thought. You have to admit this, and you have to ask God to forgive you. You have to say, Father, forgive me. Then God will give you joy and drive away and Father God will give you faith but you, if you are still filled with worries and concerns and, and say I'm still not committing sins I love God and I trust the shepherd and trust the church you have to set a standard from the Bible and this gospel is the gospel of sanctification it that points out sins, we have to look back on ourselves and change ourselves. You're reading the senior pastor's books. You, are, we, you understand the deep levels of goodness of Abraham and you can compare yourselves to Abraham. You know, as you compare your... You know, as we see how Jacob did we have to lower ourselves and discover ourselves if we just receive grace and I mean if you think that's what Jacob did and they were only insisting on their opinions such aspects I mean, we have to... That's how we sanctify ourselves. Even though we don't hate someone, Jacob didn't want to make peace with his uncle Laban. That's why they set up a stone and they made a 
treaty, they, they wouldn't cross each other. Father God wanted them to make peace. How would Abraham done? We don't want to, if you don't want to make peace with others, but just keep a distance with others, you are far from sanctification. You are far from being with God. We have to discover such aspects of you and try to change ourselves. After Joshua conquered the city of Ai, he briefly took a break from the conquering battles and led his people toward the mountains located some distance away. The Israelites had awakening moments through a c o n s e n s and their defeat, so Joshua felt the need to teach the people once again. Also, this was to carry out a special command Moses gave to Israel before his death. Moses said, It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land when you are entering to possess it. That's why Moses confessed. That's always how Moses confessed. He said that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. In the middle of the land of Canaan were two mountains, Gerizim and Ebal. Joshua divided the Israelites in two groups and had each group stand on each mountain. And he had Joshua shout out God's laws to the people. When when he proclaimed the words of blessings, people standing on Gerizim responded with Amen. When he did the words of curses, those standing on Abel responded. Can you imagine how this proclamation of God's commands affected the hearts of the Israelites? While millions of people were standing in two groups, God's laws were solemnly proclaimed and the people responded to both the words of blessings and those of curses with loud amens. Those who participated in such a solemn ceremony couldn't have dared violate God's commands. As I told you, that's how the second generation did. At the end of the book of Joshua, the elders and the people who were with Joshua until that point, they served God according to the Bible. Those people who are They, which means they inscribe the word of God on their heart. As they confessed blessings and curses, they confessed what kind of blessings they would receive and what kind of curses they would suffer. As they did so, they inscribed deep on their heart. Actually, the words were already taught by Moses numerous times. But through a few incidents, they experienced experienced them themselves. They were defeated in the city of Ai. Through such incidents, they had kept in mind all the more. They learned that if they failed to keep the word, they would suffer trouble. They kept it in their mind and made a confession. The importance of keeping God's commands cannot be stressed enough. And Joshua was also emphasizing the importance of keeping God's command and and the people engraved them on their mind and kept them. But regrettably, Although Israel always learned them, they repeatedly sinned and suffered from diseases, oppression from the Gentiles. They they learned about how their ancestors lived, but they didn't live by the words. As we confirmed, 
As their history confirms, the people who were with Joshua served God, but their next generation, during the time of the judges, the Israelites didn't keep the word of God. Throughout their history, they repeatedly commit sins, thereby suffering from diseases, oppression from the Gentiles, etc. As their afflictions intensified, Israel turned back, repented, and kept His commands again. Then God saved them. But as peaceful days went on, they again left God, forsaking His commands. As they repeated the cycle numerous times, their iniquities built up all the more. Later, they were completely destroyed by the Gentiles. They faced the outcome of forgetting what God exalted them to do numerous times and forsaking His commands. Such regretful sins reflect what human beings are like. We accept the Lord as our Savior, believe God to be our Father, and learn His will. We learn that we are blessed when we live by the words and that we, when we disobey, God cannot protect us. So the enemy devil brings us trials and tribulations. But as many people prioritize physical well-being, pleasure, and benefits, they depart from the world. If you depart from the word, commit sins and evil, it may seem that you are not suffering disasters. You may think that those people are suffering, committing sins, but they are not suffering disasters. But they will go to, go to hell. So that's why they are if they don't have a chance of repenting through disaster, it's more frightening. You have to check yourselves. When you are in peace, do you think, I'm in peace? Uh, do you take a break from praying and seek your own will? Even if you take a If you commit sins, you may finally, when you are in trouble, you hang on to God by prayer, fasting, and try to live by the word. Then, Father God resolves your problem. But after that, you soon have a change of heart. And you are heartily spotted in the church. You stop praying and circumcising your heart and, their f- and your faithfulness cools down. Some of you even leave the church. Even after having your problems resolved, you go back to the world living in sins and evil, thereby suffering greater trouble. After Jesus healed a leper, He warned them, do not sin anymore so that nothing ha- worse happens to you. Also, the Bible says, For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse than them than the first. Namely, God says that if they don't live by the word, their situation gets worse than, than it was initially. Years ago, a A great number of people came to our revival meetings and received healing, but many of them left God. Having heard the words of life and learned God's will, they should have lived by it and made their souls prosper. But after they were healed, they just left. Then they again committed sins, took worldly things, got sick again, and came back for the revival meeting the following year. As we saw people testifying on the altar, they said like, I was healed last year, but I came back. (laughs) Seeing this, I was very... This is what human beings are like. Some of them even said, because we have a revival meeting next year, I can be healed again anyway. We have to know that we don't attend church to receive healing or financial blessings, but to receive salvation and enter heaven. We do. to hear the words of life, have our souls prosper, receive salvation, and enter heaven. If people come to church just in pursuit of blessings of this earth, how could God consider this faith? 
because you wouldn't you would leave church after getting blessed, God cannot work. So they can receive blessed answers. If you indeed faith in your heart, if you stay faithful with your love for God, regardless of your... God surely blesses you according to what you've done and sown. What God wants for His children is not pretending to believe in Him because of trouble. God wants them to indeed figure out His heart, give thanks for His love, joyfully keep His commands, and even make their heart holy, taking after Himself. We are not living a Christian life because of someone. We are remaining in this church not because of someone. It is, it is for you to enter New Jerusalem. and to become sanctified. Even in trials and difficulties, you remain here because you know that this is the way to entering New Jerusalem. And it is what we have to do. But some people say, I've lost the fullness of the Spirit because of someone. That proves your faith was not true. Others say, because the pastor is not around, you have to be ashamed of saying that. That proves your lack of faith. You have to repent of them and turn back. Only then can you enjoy His presence with you. We have met the church, met the shepherd, and we have met the invisible God. We were happy. If we hold on to, just hold on to this fact, we can stay joyful. You know, you saw the testimony last Friday. You know, there are many people, such people. They didn't consider their God-given duty small. They hold on to, you know, he said, I don't have to see more. And he held on to what he saw and kept going. And that's how he was continually blessed. Father God is looking for such children. And he is making us into such people and leading us to New Jerusalem. He had His only begotten Son who is totally sinless die on the cross. In addition, He sent us the Holy Spirit who perfectly knows His heart, helping us figure out His will and live accordingly. Thus, we should never become foolish ones who forget the commands we've heard and suffer disasters. Why have you failed Why do you make friends with the world? We have no reason to do that. It's because you didn't believe in God holy. It's because you didn't believe in hell and heaven. Nothing could take our faith away. By engraving the words holy on our heart and obeying, we should all become true children whom God wants. Now, Joshua and the Israelites were preparing for the next battle to fully take possession of Canaan. The kings of Canaan were scared of Israel, but at the same time, they were busy forming alliances with each other to confront it, to confront Israel. Meanwhile, a group of people came before Joshua. They were envoys dispatched for a peace treaty They were envoys from other nations. Earlier, God commanded Israel never to make a covenant with the Canaanites. He said, When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Gergeshites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jubasites, seven nations greater and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them for you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. God already told them among the seven tribes of Canaan the Gilgoshites were relatively small because they were scattered among other tribes later on in some parts of the Bible only six tribes are mentioned without them 
God commanded Israel never to ally or make peace treaty with the seven tribes, including the Gilgosites, and He told them not to leave them alive. But these people who came before Joshua claimed that they came from afar and had nothing to do with the Canaanites. They pretended they were not Canaanites. They claimed that they traveled so far that their bread had become crumbled and their clothes, sandals, and white skins had worn out. They even presented clear evidences. Based on how shabby they looked, it seemed that their words made sense and that making a treaty with them wouldn't hurt. They were not because they were it seemed that they were not Canaanites and their claims and their evidences were plausible. In the next session, we will explore how Joshua and Israel dealt with them. Up to the last session, I told you how the Israelites with Joshua, I mean, I told you how the Israelites had crossed the overflowing Jordan only through faith and obedience and destroyed Jericho with great ease. Weren't you excited by God's marvelous works? We also talked about how Israel, of which only victory was expected, suffered a defeat in the small city of Ai. They were like a racing car speeding on the track. But as an obstacle came out of nowhere, they had to slam on the brakes and make a brief stop. At at such a time, it was important that they discover exactly what was wrong, have it fixed, and again race up vigorously. It's the same in our Christian life. Watching the power of God manifested by the shepherd, we ran vigorously with hope for New Jerusalem. We achieved spiritual growth and received healing, answers, and blessings. But recently, it feels like we've slowed down or come to a halt. But this is an opportunity to discover our shortcomings and change ourselves. When we were with the shepherd, We have to check whether we confessed it is the 99% of the justice the shepherd fulfilled. And people confessed so. It was really true. While Sina Pastor was with us, it seemed like we could control our evil. But while he is not around, we are out of control. It is a good attitude to discover ourselves. And if you discover yourself, you have to change yourself. We have to figure out God's will, fix our shortcomings, and change ourselves into beautiful ones and keep running. And then we can run at a faster speed. But if we just give up without changing ourselves, Canaan would get farther and farther away from us. The Bible says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, We are having a time of test to fulfill the justice. Do you want to go to New Jerusalem hand in hand with the shepherd? Then you have to show the evidence of your qualification. Just as we've been taught, we have to live and change ourselves, making an effort. But as we look at ourselves, we realize that we cannot do so on our own. But you shouldn't give up, but rely on God in prayer and fasting, then you can cast off evil and sins. You can make it. But you shouldn't say like, you shouldn't just focus on on the days when you live a good Christian life. Right now, you have to stay on the alert and remove sins and evil like egg and head. As God says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands like he, that he does not fall. We should humbly lower ourselves, always stay on alert in prayer, and become strong enough to beat the enemy devil, prowling like a rolling lion. I pray in our Lord's name that all of you will only obey God's guidance and finally become qualified for New Jerusalem.
Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables and internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bonds of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.